First of all, I'm Don Sari. I'm uh, chair of the US NMO for YASA, and I'm also chair of the council uh, at YASA. And it's my privilege uh, to introduce uh, Ambassador uh, Wolfgang Waldner. Now, Ambassador Wolfgang Waldner was born and raised in Wilk, Austria. He started his career in the Federal Ministry for the European and International Affairs in 1981. Previous to his appointment as Australian, uh, Austrian, not Australian, uh, it's the one without, I gotta remember, which one has the pump, which one has the kangaroos and which one's the <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> uh, uh, As the Austrian ambassador to the U.S., he served as State Secretary for the European and International Affairs from 2011 to 2012 in the regional government of Carinthia and as director of the Museum Corte in Vienna uh, in, from 99 to 2011. He served two postings in the U.S. as director of the Austrian Cultural Fora in Washington, D.C. and New York. In fact, uh, while we were standing here, uh, we heard some nice stories about his sailing up in uh, Lake Michigan, up near the Mackinac Islands. Uh, most recently, Ambassador Romner served as de uh, director general for cultural policy of the foreign ministry in Vienna. Ambassador Waldner is married, the father of two daughters. I am too, but I have more hair than you. <laughs> oh, you have more hair than I do, or somebody does. He holds a doctorate in law and languages of the University of Vienna, postgraduate diplomas from John Hopkins School for Advanced International Studies and the University of Science uh, in Grenoble. Uh, he he's a recent, uh, recently came here. He assumed his duties as, uh, as head of the mission in Washington on January 11th, 2016. Ambassador? Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Sari, for this uh, kind word of introduction. Uh, yes, I've been here only very shortly. I uh, actually handed over my credentials uh, 10 days ago to President Obama, and so I'm really entitled to speak to you now officially in this official capacity as Ambassador of Austria. I wouldn't uh, change for a trade in for Australia, although I like the country very much. Yeah. So it's a great pleasure for me to be here also uh, as one of my first uh, public appearances, so to speak, uh, because uh, um, the, we, as we took from the invitation, certainly our embassy or our Office of Science and Technology is co-hosting this uh, important uh, symposium with uh, YASA and with the National Academy of Sciences uh, US Committee for YASA. Um, as ambassador, uh, I'm of course uh, supposed to oversee all the various fields, also the other special offices, which includes the Office of Science and Technology. But in this case, I have also in my previous uh, assignment as uh, Director for Cultural Policy, as you mentioned, one of my responsibilities was to, uh, or included also, science diplomacy and uh, international scientific cooperation, which is part of the overall cultural field in our, in, by our definition. And international scientific cooperation, cooperation is, of course, essential in furthering the, the, um, and developing our societies. And this is particularly true uh, as we are faced uh, with great challenges, such as those going to be discussed uh, in uh, today's uh, panel discussions, sustainable development, Arctic changes, and the global climate. Uh, for many years, we, there have been very strong and dynamic uh, partnerships between the scientific communities uh, of our two countries, of Austria and the United States. And on our side, I apologize for mentioning this, uh, we have to do it. We have to do a little uh, marketing for our uh, work. Uh, it is the Office of Science and Technology at our embassy, which is uh, instrumental. Uh, we have the deputy director here, Simone Böttcher. She is doing a great job now representing also her new boss, who is in Vienna actually today and coming back tomorrow. Um, uh, Clemens Mantel, and whom you're going to see more of him, of course, in the future, in your future uh, joint projects. They do a great job because they host uh, um, annual uh, conference, the Austrian Research and Innovation Talk, which uh, is a platform for exchange of scientific developments. They support a network of uh, almost 3,000 uh, Austrian researchers and innovators in this country, which is almost unbelievable considering the small size of our country. I couldn't believe it, but that's the actual uh, fig figure. And they advance scientific col collaborations between our countries and they uh, foster the strong ties between Austria and the states. Um, 
also when it comes to science uh, policy interface and uh, to science diplomacy. So I would like, like to recognize their work here uh, officially in this uh, group. And I would also like, as we are speaking about science diplomacy, uh, recognize two gentlemen. I think one of them is in the audience. Another one is uh, due to arrive, as I was told. They both, um, we, we have worked uh, together with them for the past years, my predecessors did. Both are former science and technology advisors to the US Secretary of State. Both are currently with AAAS, um, and both have been instrumental in furthering these uh, scientific ties between our two countries. I'm speaking of uh, Dr. William Cole Glazier. I hope I pronounced your name cor correctly, sir. Uh, <laughs> senior scholar in the Center for Science Diplomacy at AAAS. Uh, he will be a speaker, as you could certainly take from your programs. And Dr. Norman Neureiter, who has not arrived yet, but he's uh, also very important uh, in this uh, cooperation between our two countries, also director at the Center for Science, Technology, and Security Policy at AAAS. And he's, he's a recipient of an Austrian very high decoration, the Austrian Cross of Honor for Science and Art First Class, which has been bestowed upon him by one of my predecessors, of course, on behalf of our president. So, YASA is a very important uh, organization for Austria and I suppose for the whole world, but especially for Austria since we are the host country. We had a good chance to talk uh, uh, with Dr. Kabat uh, uh, until uh, an hour ago. Um, it is a significant player in this uh, close partnership between our two countries. Uh, and I'm very, very proud that this organization is uh, uh, located in Vienna. I just found out that uh, it was started the same year when I began my university studies in Vienna. So uh, this is quite some time ago. It was, and you're celebrating the 45th anniversary in, in three years, so you all can imagine how uh, old I am. So um, they, are, they are located in, and uh, based in this wonderful uh, castle south of Vienna, uh, Luxembourg Castle, which, which I toured many times. Well, I was a tour guide during my uh, student years, and I took American tourists also to Luxembourg Castle. But Yasa was not so so uh, uh, settled at that time, and it was certainly not accessible for foreign tourists. Uh, um, but uh, another fact, I think, which is very, uh, which needs to be mentioned. Um, uh, I came across a recent uh, ranking or listing of YASA as being one of the top 15, I think third, number 14 in a worldwide ranking of uh, science and technology think tanks. Now I know you are much more than just a think tank or you're something dif different than a think tank, uh, but it's uh, all the, uh, it's very honorable to be mentioned in a worldwide ranking uh, in, as number 14 and I want to congratulate you on this achievement. Uh, let me briefly come back or conclude to, uh, to the, uh, going back to the concerns that uh, bring us here today. These issues uh, such as climate change, poverty, education, water, or population aging are a common concern to many countries. These problems have a global reach and can be resolved only by international cooperative action. And uh, you will start uh, these discussions in a few minutes on these uh, issues. And I'm sure these discussions will go on and uh, also go into the next years and until the next conference, probably be the main topics in your five-year uh, conference, the uh, anniversary conference, uh, which will take place in Vienna, as I understand, in 2017. Uh, and um, we are very proud of these uh, also big conferences, which bring together real leaders, uh, scientific leaders, political leaders from all over the world. And we will try our best also to contribute uh, that this conference is going to be a big one again uh, in Vienna. And um, I'd like to conc conclude by saying that um, 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 these are our joint objectives uh, which are being discussed here. The sustainable development goals uh, are, of course, uh, very, very on everybody's mind, everybody's mind, and we are anxious to seeing them transformed from aspiration to reality uh, through your work and through your uh, 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 endeavors. And uh, in this sense, I'd like to wish uh, you a very good conference, and uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for your words. Um, my training in PhD is in mathematics. And uh, in mathematics, we do a lot of work on existence theorems. 
And I think that much is important, uh, you know, the conference we have right here is talking about existence of a different kind, existence of us, of our society. So it's going to be a very, very important uh, discussion that we have. And to start us off, I would like to have Pablo Cabot come up and give some introductory comments. Thank you, Don, and um, also on behalf of YASA, I'm happy to be here, and I would like uh, to recognize again Ambassador Waldner and all the fantastic colleagues and supporters of YASA over the years who are sitting in the room. It feels uh, always so good to be here, to be uh, so supported by national academies as YASA, by OSTP, by State Department, by all of you, and this is so important for the world. So thank you, thank you very much for that. I will be introducing the first panel this afternoon, which is about sustainable development goals, SDGs as we call them, which were adopted last September by United Nations General Assembly. YASA was there proudly listening to the announcement of the heads of states about the commitments, because YASA was proud to contribute by its science to many of the discussions before the adoption. Then. I will um, start with um, remembering how important 2015 was for what we call sustainable futures of the world. Many of the key gatherings happened. It started um, with the Sustainable Energy for All Forum. I will come to it, the Energy for All, which was supported by ASA, major masterwork, uh, which was called Global Energy Assessment. Um, it went to the Energy Forum in Vienna in June. There was a, uh, of course, very important scientific meeting in Paris with 2,000 scientists. YASA was in the center of it to prepare scientific debate of the uh, so-called COP meeting in Paris. Then we went as a scientist to support a big conference in Addis Abeba in Ethiopia about how to fund all of these ambitions, financing of the sustainable development. Then we went to the already mentioned uh, summit of the United Nations with 178 heads of states in New York and Pope Franciscus, by the way, coming to the United States, announcing the 17th ambitions, as I call them, and it ended with a uh, big success of the Paris Agreement, which um, we had uh, reported and read about a lot. If you look at it, then you say, this is all fantastic. But when you look under the surface, then you realize that there is no much connectivity as yet, even at this highest level of the political agreement. Let me give you an example. In New York, we all agreed about development goal number seven, which is energy. And we all made a commitment at the level of the heads of states. But there was no single word about how these commitments will be uh, traveling to Paris, knowing that the climate commitment has all to do with energy. 85% of the mitigation of climate is energy. So there is this sectorality, this silo type of attitude in governing the global scene. And this is where I'm coming from, from Yasa, to talk to you about that. So um, these development goals, there are 17 of them. I have put them here. You don't need, need really to read them, other than to realize that uh, they are all extremely ambitious. They are all sitting um, high up. Secretary General Ban Ki-moon, who, by the way, is, uh, is, is using Yasa research for many of his deliberations, uh, calls them uh, stars at the horizon. This is where our minds should go. But of course, that's a statement which uh, is also putting a lot of obligations to understanding how we get to these stars. Uh, it's about ending poverty, number one. It's about number three, which is the healthy and uh, well-being of the, of the all ages across the world, through number seven, which is about energy, et cetera, et cetera, number 11, climate. And of course, when you look at it, and when you leave New York in the General Assembly, then you realize that uh, probably what will happen now, we will start to uh, think about how to implement this in a kind of uh, sectoral approaches. We will start to compete for money. We will start to compete for the governance of this. And one thing which was clear, in New York, there was no single mention about science being partner in the implementation. It was all about uh, political momentum. It was all about how to monitor the implementation, but not think about who is going to implement and what kind of scientific support this implementation would require. This is where YASA came in. We have made a proposition to Secretary General Ban Ki-moon and to the uh, delegations, why not for the first time ever, the system integrated science, which has to tell something about these 17 goals, both individually and in the connection, 
why not to partner up with the UN and, and national system? And we have a success. I'm, com I'm coming, coming in a minute to announcing a project which we'll be discussing, which is called the World in 2050. They are interconnected, these goals. Just, uh, if you just go through this uh, red, red, red prints, poverty, hunger is connected. Of course, health is connected to poverty, et cetera, et cetera. So there is no doubt about uh, cross-sectorality, transdisciplinarity needed to achieve those. Let me just give you an example from our Yasso work, which was 100% uh, facts behind the adoption of goal number seven, which is called uh, ensure access to affordable, de reliable, sustainable modern energy. These goals are there. And we were asked in 2006 already by UN system to put together the most advanced study ever about energy futures. YASA uh, convened about 300 scientists across the world from member countries to do that. And we uh, came up with this uh, red report and some of the leaders of this report like Bob Correll are in the room. And um, we produced uh, answers to three fundamental questions. Is it possible by 2030 that the whole world would have access to the energy. Currently, two billion people, two billion people don't have access to modern energy. Second, is it possible that we will double the share of renewables in the energy mixes? Number three, is it possible we double efficiency energy system? So that um, uh, study was done, and um, it led to, uh, to a result, which I will come to in a minute, where we produced 41 plausible transformation scenarios across the world and for the major world regions about how to move from the current energy mix to the one by 2030, 2050. This is one of the examples showing how the current energy mix you see there, biogas, coal, oil, gas, nuclear, renewable, looks like now, how it may look like in 2050, satisfying these three energy goals I talk about. But we did more. We said at, at the beginning, since being IASA, Look, Secretary General, at your team. Isn't it true that energy challenge is at the same time climate mitigation challenge? Because 90% of the emission targets reduction are coming from doing something with the energy system. So we said all these scenarios we will do, but also with the constraint, all of them should be satisfying the climate mitigation targets, namely two degree maximum warming in the world. We said, by the way, Secretary General, isn't it true that Energy sector is responsible for most of the air quality problems. YASA developed in 1990s the world leading um, category of models to deal with the air quality control. So we negotiated number three sector as a part of this study, air quality. Namely, all these energy scenarios must be within the WHO limits for PM 2.5 and PM 10 in the major parts of the world. Every year, 40,000 people die because of the air quality. We said, Secretary General, can we add sector health, number four, and can we have the scenario for the energy satisfying the condition of lowering number of people dying by factor 10? So instead of mounting on a one single siloed goal, energy, we mounted on four of them together, which I think was a quite a good demonstration of the system thinking. And we got, we got that, the study done. We got a study done for, um, all those sectors together. We produced the report. It was presented at Rio plus, uh, plus 20. It was adopted. It led to 500 billion pledges to invest. At the time, Mr. Chet Holiday, Bank of America, was leading Secretary Ban Ki-moon uh, think tank. And it provided all these all this, uh, safe lending passes. But the most important part for YASA is this single picture, which is showing economic analysis of sectoral investment versus system investments. What you see here, the vertical axis is the percentage of the global GDP, currently about 100 trillion US dollars, so percentage of that. You see there's three columns. One is how much would it cost if we do as we do it every day, implementing one single goal, one single sector. We will, we will need about 200 billion a year, sustained for the next 30 years to achieve these three energy goals. Second column shows how much would it cost if the all major mega cities around the world, from uh, Shanghai to, uh, to New Delhi, et cetera, et cetera, would comply with the healthy air quality, which is PM 2.5, PM 10 limits. It would cost us about 600 billion a year for the next 30 years. The last one is the climate mitigation, about 800 billion a year for the next 30 years to achieve the two degree maximum warming. 
If you put all this together, you end up at something like 2 to 0.5 percent of the global GDP annually to do it in the old way, sector by sector, science discipline by science discipline. This is what came out when you do it all together. 40 up to 50 percent savings, 100 billion a year, the world can save itself if we accept notion of system thinking. If we break the silos of disciplines, if we break the silos of ministries, if we convince Minister of Energy not to compete for his budget with environment, but to do it together. This is one of the most powerful messages which has brought to the world in this system thinking. If you take this and then go to the SDGs, they are all about climate, sitting nicely there. There is energy one, there is one on air quality environment. And our proposition to the world is, let's unify around the system thinking comp uh, concept Let's start a project which we um, called World 2050. By the way, this is something which I will show you as well. It's not only about environment and water and energy. It's also about education, human potential. These are recent data about um, how so-called knowledge capital, and Wolfgang Klus will be talking about this, is connected to the economic wealth. You see here the uh, conditional test score on the knowledge capital, and you see here the uh, GDP of the countries there. It's very clear. Next is even more interesting, is our unique data coming from this upcoming study of IASA together with Jeffrey Sachs, showing the clear relationship between the unemployment rates of the major countries and the patents per million population. Knowledge, innovation, knowledge, innovation, education, and the wealth of this planet, clearly connected. And these connections are not made in the political document called SDGs. This is where the project which we are launching rolled in 2050 together with uh, those four partners, having already on board about 60 international partners, trying to become a long-term partner in implementation of the SDGs, trying to put together best modeling groups across the world, from the United States already seven, to stay there for at least five up to 10 years and to prevent the world from misinvesting in the development goals by being sectoral, being only uh, one disciplinary, or forgetting about changing environment. What I mean by that, when we launched this global energy assessment, I remember it very well because I came to EASA, it was six months after my arrival. There was this discussion about on which basis uh, this calculation should be based regarding the, the, the price of the most important commodity, which is oil and gas. The colleagues at EASA and outside EASA did uh, inventory across the world talking to the biggest in the sectors, Shell, Total, Exxon, but also to OPEC. No one at this time from this list would admit that the price of oil could be below $80 per barrel in five years' time. So all these calculations are based on that price. You can imagine what happens to investment of $100 billion to renewables based on the calculations of competing price of $80 per barrel and now $25 or $30. That's the argument for science to be there constantly. We, science and policy cannot be based on relation. We publish the paper or report, we leave it there, and then go with it. That's, that's the old model. We are advocating for partnership. This is what is happening in this project. I will skip it quickly. These are the partners. You see, you find they're not only YASA, usual SUSPE, but also OECD and IMF, who came with their models to YASA to partner up, which is the first time in the history, and all other partners. And my invitation to all of you would be to think with us how to make this project reality. Already mentioned uh, by Ambassador Volner, we are, of course, very much uh, pleased and privileged to be in Austria. This is the facility which he talks about, and I hope that those of you who were not yet there will visit us very soon. Thank you very much. Uh, as we're coming up, as I stated, uh, you know, the issues we're talking about pretty much existence, aren't they? Existence of life as we know or life as we would like it to be. But um, I know that some of the people here are trying to find out what's going on. Some of the people here are trying to find out what are the obstacles. And I think that uh, Pavel already identified some of them in terms of silo thinking and th for things like this. And also, uh, we're interested in what can we do? What can we do to try, can we as individual countries, what can we do to try to make advances? And I hope to get some of those answers from uh, our uh, speakers here this morning. Uh, what you have is, this afternoon, excuse me, uh, you have 10 minutes and I'll let you know and then we'll have, open it up for questions.
Sorry, I start by saying I've been a fan of IASA for, for a very long time, mainly by having several mentors in the 1980s when the U.S. government backed out of IASA, and it was the U.S. academic community that maintained U.S. participation still, until the government came back in. And I thought it was also very nice this, this morning that the ambassador mentioned science diplomacy. I was at a meeting this morning of science advice and foreign ministries where there are four uh, science advisors to four foreign ministries, U.S., U.K., uh, uh, New Zealand, and Japan, and having a meeting tomorrow trying to encourage other foreign ministries to think how they can incorporate more science and technology into their, uh, uh, into their foreign policy. But, but let me tell you how I got involved with the whole issue of sustainable development goals when I was in the State Department in 2013 and 2014. In part, it was because there was a mandate to the U.N. professional staff to increase to strengthen the science policy interface related to what became the 2030 Agenda. And uh, first it was something called the Global Sustainable Development Report, which was another one of the mandates that over this next 15 years, there will be this report produced by the UN system uh, every year, in fact, although it'll vary on how big or how small it is. And the uh, professional staff wanted to ensure that it was really interacting with the scientific community of the world and producing this report. So these reports were not sort of one-off exercises, but actually was a process of involvement that would last over this, uh, this period. Uh, the, the, the second uh, way I've been involved, particularly after uh, uh, leaving the government, was another one of the initiatives created at the 2030 Agenda. It's called the Technology Facilitation Mechanism. Although it doesn't deal just with uh, technology, it came out of the, uh, uh, the Addis Ababa meeting, which was right before the UN meeting in September. There has been a debate among developed and developing countries for many years dealing with intellectual property, sometimes a very, not very useful debate, but actually there was consensus on what should be a part of the 2030 agenda relating to technology, and that was this technology facilitation mechanism, but it's really to focus on the role of science, technology, and innovation related to achieving the uh, sustainable development goals, and it has three components, which I'll mention briefly in just a moment. I think these two initiatives together, the fact they're going to be these global sustainable development reports, as well as this new mechanism lasting over the next 15 years, I think it's a great opportunity for the science community to be involved in, in very many ways in depth with the leadership at the United Nations. So I think it is a real opportunity for the scientific community that we shouldn't miss. What I learned by being involved over this period, I'll just give you a few of the things, at least insights that, uh, that came to me. Uh, the purpose of the 2030 Agenda, the purpose of the 17 Sustainable Development Goals is actually to stimulate action by governments, by societies, by the public sector, by the private sector in countries, actions that will help lead to achieving the Sustainable Development Goals. So if you try to think, how can science and technology and innovation contribute to what is this overarching purpose? Uh, sort of a simple-minded way to think that I sort of see four ways. One, of course, is, is understanding and identifying the, the challenges, which is absolutely essential. Uh, but also very important is actually advising on actions that are taken, sort of pointing out what might work, what can work, uh, looking also retrospectively of what has failed and, and uh, things that need to be changed. And so I think the science and technology community gets, needs to get very much involved in advising along this pathway that goes over the next 15 years. Uh, the third way, of course, is indicators to see if we're making progress. And as you know, with the, the sustainable development goals, I think there's something like 169 indicators. Uh, there's some that are better than others. Targets. Targets, Targets excuse me. There, there, there's some that are, so yeah, the, the language, so even the UN speaks sometimes gets to me. The, uh, the 169 uh, targets, some are better than others. Some actually provide uh, what I would consider to be an, a very good roadmap for how to make progress, the things to work on. I, I think the health one is one that's a very good indication of an excellent one. Others, uh, I think there's a lot to science, technology, uh, and innovation can contribute that really aren't recognized in the targets that exist for, uh, for some of the goals. So I think that's going to be something that evolves uh, over time, and I think next month there are going to be the metrics that go along with uh, the number of targets that will help us to judge progress. But the fourth way that I think science, technology, and innovation can contribute which actually may be the most important is, as you all know, science and technology are moving incredibly fast. And over 15 years, there are going to be new innovations that we probably can't even anticipate now. So I think one of the most important things for the science and technology community to do is to help stimulate uh, the possibilities of new innovative approaches for dealing with these issues. And that's really going to be in part from investments in research and development, uh, thinking about the challenges and what new technologies, uh, new options that might exist to make progress faster. 
So I think with the 17 goals, science, technology, and innovation are absolutely key for, for every single one of them. Uh, as you heard from Pavel, there are all these interconnections, so we have to use systems thinking. I think that's what the IASA is, uh, is parallel at, and it's reminding us of the importance of that, that uh, there are trade-offs in some cases but between the goals. But if we use system thinking, we can maximize, I think, achieving, achieving them all. Of course, all of us will, in my case too, will feel that there's some goals that are, that are more important than others and ones that I think particularly important to, uh, to, to focus on. Uh, w one of the things in being involved for these, uh, these past two years and, and thinking about all of this, sort of at a, at a higher level, one of the, what I came to conclude was one of the most important things I think we can do, the scientific and technical community, is to help stimulate more science and technology capacity building around the world, to create more uh, knowledge-based economies, uh, innovative societies around the world. If we look at what is gonna be the, uh, the main contribution of our generation to future generations, it's probably expanding human knowledge and human capacity, building that in every country so they use more scientific input in their decision-making. And I think there are several of the goals that are extremely important related to this overarching issue of building more science and technology capacity, more innovative thinking in, in countries. Uh, the last thing, just to come back briefly to the technology facilitation mechanism so you're aware of it in case you're, you're interested, there, there are three aspects. One is there's an interagency task team of the UN agencies with, uh, with 10 outside advisors, of which uh, I am one, uh, Naki from, uh, Professor Nakachinovitz from, uh, from IASA is another, both from civil society as well as from science. Uh, there is a, a forum, the first one that's going to occur in early June uh, in New York, again focusing in on science, technology, innovation, and there's going to be an online platform to enable participants everywhere to be involved to make it a process as opposed to, uh, to one-time events. So I'd encourage you that are interested both being involved in this technology facilitation mechanism as well as a process that's going on in the UN producing these global sustainable development reports. I think there are lots of opportunities uh, for the science community to be, to be part of that. And lastly, my, my last comment is, since the purpose of the 17 goals is to stimulate action, as you know, there's no binding treaty on what countries need to do in this case, almost so like the case with, with climate. Uh, so what really is needed that every country needs to think very seriously about developing its roadmap, not only achieving each one of the goals, but also how you achieve them all together in an integrated fashion. Uh, speaking out of school, my country, I think the U.S. government's position often is that this really doesn't apply to the U.S. It really applies to developing countries. But the U.S. has its own problems with inequality, with poverty, with all of these issues, as well as the global commons that we all have to worry about. So I think one of the most useful things we can do is to encourage our countries, our scientific bodies in our countries to think seriously about what is the roadmap of how our country is going to contribute, both nationally as well as globally, in trying to achieve each one of these goals as well as all of them together. All right, good afternoon. Uh, I'm going to be talking about one very important stakeholder in this process of a sustainable development goes, namely about us, about the human population on this planet. It is us who have caused many of the problems that we are dealing with, and it is our future human well-being. That's actually the reason why we are concerned. Well, uh, population growth uh, is called by some people as sort of the elephant in the room in the SDGs because it is nowhere explicitly mentioned, although many people think it is one of the main threats, one of the main drivers uh, that makes it more difficult um, to solve the problems. It's through the number of consumers and their impact on the environment at a given level of per capita consumption, more people mean more problems. Um, it, although the population growing rapidly makes it more difficult to expand the social services that we value so much, like education, health care, and reducing poverty. And uh, through more people with higher vulnerability, uh, being exposed to natural disasters and other environmental change, particularly in the context of climate change, it's more difficult uh, to uh, assure the resilience of this larger number of people. Uh, and last not least, uh, this uh, may be an increasing threat. Uh, 
and likelihood of conflict and even uncontrolled mass migration, something that at least in Europe is a major concern these days. So these are some of the issues, uh, why population matters really for our future human well-being. But despite of the fact that it's not explicitly targeted, uh, there are several of the sustainable development goals that directly matter for population and influence future population trends. So under the, uh, the goal three on health, uh, there is explicit mentioning also of reproductive health services, including family planning. Uh, child mortality is a very important target to significantly lower it. And very important, as I will now demonstrate also, are the education-related targets about universal primary and secondary education, because universally uh, more educated women have fewer children, and particularly in developing countries. So we have DIASA have been producing world population scenarios, not only by age and sex, as conventional demography does, but also by level of educational attainment. And you see here in colors, education. So a red means uh, no education, never been to school, then the light red, incomplete primary, up to the dark red, which dark blue, which is a completed tertiary education. And you see, uh, in 1970, really, more than half of the world population had very, very low or no education altogether. So the blue area has been expanding, and that's the good news. Also in the future, much of the population growth that we see in the future is an increasing number of people with higher education. But still there are segments, particularly in Africa and parts of South Asia, with very low or no education. So that's the middle of the road scenario. And uh, as you see the SSP1 and 3, these are more optimistic and pessimistic scenarios. And I'm going to tell you later more about this. Also, you see the UN population projections, the most recent ones, are somewhat higher. And part of the reason is that they are not explicitly addressing this issue of improving educational attainment uh, where women with more education will have fewer children. OK, so adding education to age and sex, and I'm not going to go into any details, really matters for two main reasons. The one is uh, that, um, as I said, the uh, more educated people do not only have uh, fewer birth rates, but they live longer, and they have also different migration patterns. So explicitly focusing on this really changes the population forecast. But of course, education also is a crucial determinant of individual empowerment or human capital, as the economists call it. And therefore, it's a key driver of socioeconomic development, ranging from public health uh, to economic growth, even the quality of institutions, democracy, we've shown to be very highly dependent on the uh, education of the broad segments of population, and ultimately also adaptive capacity uh, to already unavoidable climate change. Just to illustrate this a bit, one of my favorite pictures is this adding color to the age pyramid. So this is the example of Singapore in 1970. So the red again is uh, women and men without any education or dark blue tertiary. Uh, you see um, Singapore in the 50s was a miserable place. It was desperately poor, completely uneducated, malaria ridden. And then uh, early in the 60s, they really started massively to invest in education, still at a poor state. And now you see a population here where the older ones, above age 40, are essentially all uneducated. They cannot even read and write, whereas the younger generation gets better educated. And now this process, what I would call demographic metabolism, intergenerational change, moving up the age pyramid, shows how in 1980, 1990, the young population really got much better educated. And this was the time when public health improved, malaria was eradicated, and in particular, this phenomenon Phenomenal economic growth happened when these highly educated young people came into the main working ages. But at the same time, the elderly are still uneducated, were still uneducated then and are still today. So 2000, now uh, young people in Singapore are already better educated than young people in Europe and the US. 2010, and of course we can continue this in the future. This is now under the middle of the road scenario, Singapore 2020. Now you see, of course, more educated women have much fewer children, so you have significant population aging here. But since the population is so much better educated, and this is the same question we're facing in Europe or in the US, uh, can the better educated young population compensate in terms of higher productivity uh, for their smaller numbers? OK, uh, we've put uh, much of this together uh, in, a, in a framework, really, uh, to view the future of the world population, uh, also by human capital, and see what education by itself makes uh, to world population growth. And uh, here we showed sort of two alternative scenarios. 
they have identical sets of birth rates for women by different education level, but we only have different education scenarios. So here, this is the most pessimistic, constant enrollment numbers, no new schools being built. And you see the world population increasing very rapidly, hitting already the 10 billion mark by the middle of the century. The same education-specific fertility rates, but much stronger efforts in education. Really, every country in Africa essentially launching something that's similar to what we've seen in Singapore or Korea. And you see many more educated, and already by the mid-century, more than one billion less on this planet. So then about the effect, the interactions, the synergies between education, health, and uh, population growth. Um, now, what about economic growth? With the same... Uh, age-specific education patterns that we've reconstructed for all countries of the world, we could now newly address this main and important economic question, what are the key drivers of international economic growth? Economists have struggled with this. Theory tells, yes, human capital is the key driver, should be the key driver, but their economic growth regressions didn't show it consistently because they had the wrong education variables. They just took the mean years of schooling for all the age groups together. Once we differentiate by age, uh, as I showed in Singapore, the specific age groups coming into the decisive ages, then it comes out beautifully clear that indeed education is the key driver of economic growth. And we have a significant underfinding that you see here on the right-hand side, that universal primary education is not enough to get poor countries out of poverty, it really requires the education, secondary education of broad segments of the population. And this was in 2008 when the Millennium Development Goals still were focusing only on universal primary education. And therefore we are very happy to see now that the 2015 Sustainable Development Goal 4 uh, talks about quality primary and secondary education for all girls and boys. Now, uh, education also is not only a driver of many of the good things, a determinant, it also helps to protect us. So here what is plotted is sort of the circular thing. You have the human population consuming, causing greenhouse gas emissions, contributing to climate change. But it was mentioned just before uh, that also innovation and technological improvements may have big role in mitigation of climate change, but this also has to be invented by the human beings, by us, and it depends on our uh, education, our skills, and the, the institutions that we have. So these both avenues uh, influence climate change, but then there is already unavoidable climate change that will affect our future well-being, and therefore the notion of differential vulnerability is quite important. We are not all equally affected. Some people are affected more than others depending, of course, on the place where they live, but even at a given location, it depends on age, on the gender of the person, and also very much on the education level we could show. And uh, we did a global analysis of this, and you, you know there's this green climate fund that should uh, be up to $100 billion per year. And the good question is, what will happen with this money? So far, most of the money is going into infrastructure, uh, concrete projects in the dual sense of the, of the word, uh, building walls and so on. And uh, we showed actually universal education is uh, more meaningful, at or at least an additional important investment. And Science Magazine put here the subtitle that we didn't put, but it upset some engineers. But I'm always saying we are not saying that they should not get money, but they should not get all the money. Educators, increasing the human capital also should be funded. OK, actually, I'm coming to the conclusion. Uh, YASA, together with many other institutions in the world, has been developing this new set of global scenarios, the so-called SSPs, Shared Socioeconomic Pathways, that captures both uh, the socioeconomic challenges to climate change mitigation as well as adaptation on the other axis. So along the diagonal, you have the SSP 1, 2, 3, going from a rapid social development, sustainability, uh, to a stalled development and fragmentation. And we've recently, in a major book uh, that was dedicated to Nathan Kiefitz, who was the leader of the World Population Program in the 1990s, after uh, being Professor Emeritus from Harvard University, who really developed these methods of multidimensional demography that we applied now to all countries in the world. So this is the SSP2, in a way, the middle of the roast, if you want the most likely scenario. Here we see a peaking of world population in the 2060s, 70s, around 9.4 billion, and then slightly declining. And you see also a, a very 
broad uh, expansion of the more educated population. And that is likely because in almost all countries today, uh, the younger ones are better educated than the older ones. But this is not granted. This is the stalled development scenario, very little improvement in education, and the world population going up to more than 12 billion. It's going to be a very, very difficult situation on this planet. And we can have the SSP1, which is a rapid development scenario, peaking earlier and even better educated. Now, uh, we are just at the moment in an exercise to translate the development goals into one S SDG population scenario. And the outcome is very close to SSP1. So if the, SS S the sustainable development goals are indeed realized, we may see a future like this. Thank you very much. Thank you. I neglected to... Uh state where they're from. Uh, William Kalkheiser from the AAAS Center for Science Diplomacy. Wolfgang Lutz is director of the AAA, of the YASA, excuse me, uh, World Population Program. And now we'll hear from Jennifer Park, who is from the Office of Management and Budget. Jennifer. So often, why is a nice girl from the budget coming to, to come to speak to me about statistics and, and science? And I work for the office of the chief statistician, Catherine Wallman, who could not be here today. Um, but I'm very glad to tell you about our involvement with the Sustainable Development Goals and our colleagues in the State Department, uh, USAID, throughout the U.S. government, and our colleagues in the U.N. Statistical Commission um, as we are working together to monitor progress against these goals. So I, I thought that I would start with the main points in case I started telling stories and ran out of time. Um, but in a nutshell, this is where we're at. The Statistical Commission was asked by UNGA in September of last year to, to identify indicators for measurement of progress against the goals and targets of the Sustainable Development Goals. And the 17 goals have been identified for you. There are 169 targets. And why we quibble about indicators and targets is the indicators are what we would be using to monitor progress across countries on a global level on a regular basis. And currently, that number is about 235, and it's going to increase. Uh, so we have to deliver this set of, uh, of indicators by March 2016. And yes, that's in a few weeks. <laughs> in New York. The Statistical Commission said, okay, well, how do we do this? We'll form some committees, because that's what we do. And um, they created two. The first is the Interagency Expert Group, and the United States is an observer to that activity. We work closely with Canada on that activity. And that group was tasked with trying to figure out how to measure progress against these targets, right? Where do we start? Um, and in fact, the IAEG has delivered a set, a framework set of indicators. I'll tell you a little bit about it, but it's still a deliberative process. You'll appreciate until the last possible minute, there are going to be some changes here or there. Um, but I think it's important to manage expectations about what the framework of indicators is and what it's not and what it will allow the scientific community in particular to think about over the next 15 years. Um, it's really a framework. It's a starting point. And like any other aspect of science that's robust, it's going to be constantly evaluated over time. It doesn't mean that it's not a good starting point. It's saying this is the best that we can reach consensus on at this moment. This is identifying the areas where we need further methodological work. This is identifying areas where we don't have any data yet. We have to figure out how to obtain them. Um, and we have to continually um, revise and reassess if, for example, we're getting any variation on these indicators from a statistical standpoint. Um, if we're not seeing any variation, then our indicator is probably not very good. We need to go back and revisit that. But that's OK, because that's good science. So that framework that's being delivered is not a final set, we figured it out, this is what you have to measure progress on. It's this is where we are today. Now, that framework is going to identify areas where consensus has been reached and areas for further methodological development and areas where data are, are still required. There's a second committee that the UN Statistical Commission has established, the high-level group. It's a very long name, but all you need to know is the high-level group, one of many high-level groups. Um, that is meant to focus on identifying capacity building, 
statistical capacity building, identifying ways to use big data to produce official statistics, to enable uh, national statistical offices to produce data, and to educate their publics about how to use those data and how to access those data. And I, I think uh, uh, an underlying point is it's not just that we're achieving the SDGs or working toward that, which is obviously fundamental, but it's all the things that we're doing in order to monitor our progress that is also lifting up the scientific community, lifting up the statistical community. As we figure out ways to measure, how we figure out ways to better work with big data um, and figure out what is most important to measure, we're lifting up the scientific field as well. So that's very exciting for me. So now I'll go into the details since I have a moment or two. So just as a reminder for those of you who are not familiar, the Statistical Commission was uh, tasked with selecting the indicators. It was very important that that process remain a technical process. And the Statistical Commission has a very well, long-established uh, tradition of being separate from the more policy-oriented discussions within the UN. And so it's been working through that 